Welcome back, Canaanites. With the Microsoft Showcase just a few days away, I wanted to make another of these small videos to fill the void, though this time, something at least tangentially related to Halo Infinite. While this year we'll almost certainly see a multiplayer demo and little, if any, campaign footage, and while I doubt Mendicant Bias will actually appear in Halo Infinite, with the fact that we're going to Installation 07, Mendy B's old haunt, I thought a discussion about our favorite traitor's origins might make for a little fun. And before we dive in, I want to note that this video is actually heavily inspired by an old article by Horispis on his personal blog. Titled, Mendicant Bias is Ancient Human, basically giving away the thesis of the article and this video, I would highly recommend you check that out in addition to this video. I'm going to try and give this my own spin, I'm not going to be reading directly from the blog, but you will see some significant overlap. With that though, let's dive in. Halo has featured a number of characters that shape its story in grand ways, and from an in-universe perspective, few have done so on such a scale as Mendicant Bias. An Ancilla, the forerunner equivalent of an AI, of unspeakable computing power, Mendicant is a contender class, a part of the larger Metarch class of Ancilla. Metarchs were top tier among forerunner Ancilla, yet contenders were described as, quote, as far above Ancillas as the Metarch level systems rise above our personal components. In other words, virtually nothing could contend with a contender. And that was for very good reason. Mendicant Bias was created by two forerunners, the Master Builder and the Didact, both incredibly influential characters and bitter rivals towards the end of the forerunner Ecumene. Considered the bastard child of the pair, Mendicant was a project of cooperation in the millennia before the Forerunner Flood War, designed to help manage the early planning of what became the Halo Array and could, once the Flood returned, coordinate Forerunner forces against the Parasite. To a degree, we can understand what was so special about Mendicant Bias that the entire Ecumene's defenses could be ceded to him, but the fundamental question is, why was he so special? What was it about him that elevated the contender's capabilities and qualified him to lead the Forerunner fleets against the Flood? Well, you already know the conclusion, so let's see how we get there. The idea that Mendicant Bias might have a connection to ancient humanity can be seen throughout the Forerunner saga by reading between the lines, but the keystone to this theory comes from a 2015 post on the old NeoGAF forums by 343's own Frank O'Connor. In response to a discussion about Cortana and Rampancy, Frakie says, quote, MB wasn't built with human technology, although we may not have been exactly alien either. And yes, Stinkles is Frankie's username on those forums. Anyway, this quote strongly hints at a human connection in mendicant bias. When ancient humanity was defeated by the Forerunners, those captured after the final battle at Charm Hakor, the final holdout, were composed, their minds and memories converted into digital information. Basically, they were turned into AI in a process that mirrors the creation of smart AI like Cortana. These imprints would then be moved into digital storage and subjected to rotating interrogation for centuries. At the same time, copies would be carried in the genetics of the remaining human population as forerunners devolved the species to more primitive forms and passed along through the generations. Composed minds had a habit of decaying over time, and one method of combating that was the aforementioned genetic storage. So, if the Forerunners ever needed fresh copies of these essences, they'd know where to look. However, it's possible that something further was done with these essences. The creation of a new class of Ancilla, far above anything that had been created before, what would become the Contender class. Beyond Frankie's quote, there is evidence to support this notion in the expanded fiction. Perhaps the most pertinent has to do with why human essences were collected in the first place. It was during the war between ancient humanity and the Forerunners that the latter species first encountered the Flood. Initially thought to be a human deception, the Flood was soon found to be all too real. Oddly, however, the Forerunners discovered that the Flood was seemingly retreating from humanity, finding entire systems that had fallen to the Flood, but with human populations left untouched, as though there were a cure or vaccine. When humanity was finally defeated, the Flood had already been driven off, and all data and samples of the Shaping Sickness gathered by humanity were destroyed. If the Forerunners had any hope of finding a supposed cure, they needed to keep the captured human memories around, hence the use of the Composer. But more than just a cure, these minds would have knowledge of how to effectively combat the Flood. In particular, among them was Forthenko, the Lord of Admirals, leader of Ancient Humanity's forces against both the Forerunners and the Flood, 
and Iprin Iprikushma, the political and morale commander who spoke with the Primordial, the last of the precursors that eventually merged with the Flood consciousness, and devised new ways of combating the Forerunners during the war. They alone would provide invaluable experience and knowledge. However, that is just the start. In Halo Primordium, we get some more interesting looks into the psychology of Mendicant. A couple times in the book, the Lord of Admirals, Forthenko, mentions Mendicant's desires in fighting the Forerunners. Quote, He will play this game for as long as it amuses, the Lord of Admirals said, and for as long as he has a chance of causing Forerunners dismay and pain. He also wishes to attack the Didact personally. And later on, the machine does not hate Forerunners, he continued, but it knows they have been arrogant and need correcting, and it takes an odd satisfaction in the prospect of having humans carry out that punishment. Why is this significant, you might ask? Well, first, let's take a look at another quote from earlier in the book when Forthenko reflects on being composed after the end of the Human Forerunner War. As the Lord of Admirals awaits his composition, the Didact laments the indignity that his kind is about to place on fellow warriors, but hopes that Forthenko might take some comfort in the notion that humans may rise again, fight again, and that Forerunner civilization may soon be coming to a close. It gave me no satisfaction. If I were to rise again, fight again, I wished only to once more match myself against the Didact. Mendicant seems to have a specific wish to fight the Didact himself and takes an odd pleasure in humans carrying out Forerunner punishment. For sure, there are other ways this could be chalked up. The Didact is essentially one of Mendicant's fathers, and many might simply appreciate the poetic justice of humans once defeated by Forerunners, aiding in the Forerunner punishment. But combined with Forthencho's final desire to re-engage with the Didact, and the note of Mendicant having an odd satisfaction for humans to carry out the Forerunner punishment, the text is hinting at something deeper. When Born Stellar makes Eternal Lasting, first meets Mendicant Bias in Halo Cryptum and again in Primordium as the Isodidact, a copy of the original Didact in essence, he brings up Mendicant's true name. In these same books, we are shown that in human culture, it's not uncommon for humans to have multiple names. In Cryptum, we learn about family names, personal names, and long names, as used by the Florians, aka Homo floresiensis. The Hamanun sitting right next to you, whose breath smells of fish oil and stale bread, his family name is Day Chaser, his personal name is Morning Riser, his long name is Day Chaser Makes Path Long Stretch Morning Riser, long name for a short fellow. He likes to be called Riser. There, it is done. Typically, one's full name is not revealed to outsiders. In Primordium, we're introduced to the concept of borrowing names and secret names when Chekas meets Venevra. Venevra is not the character's real name, though. It's her mother's name, a borrowing name. Her secret name is never revealed in the text, but it's implied that Venevra's people, a population of humans that have been moved to Gyre 11, the halo ring that would eventually become Installation 07, were much closer in culture and appearance to the ancient humans of Forthencho's day. While Mendicant having a true name could be the result of any number of reasons, it does seem odd that an author like Greg Bear would bring up this information without necessarily going anywhere or hinting at anything. We could certainly be grasping at straws here, but I think Mr. Bear deliberately left something there to grasp at, and I know others do as well. The final piece of the puzzle, for now at least, comes with Halo Silentium. In the days of the Forerunner Flood War, while Mendicant Bias is racing towards the Ark, the Gravemind takes a moment to create bodies with the imprints of ancient humans, including Forthencho, sending them to Earth to taunt the Librarian. But, as many have asked, where did the Gravemind get copies of these ancient human imprints? While the imprints in Riser, Chekas, and other humans were extracted from them during the climax of Halo Primordium, they were eventually returned by the Isodidact, and I doubt he left copies behind to be found. It's possible that the Gravemind captured them from somewhere in the Ecumene during its vast conquest. We know that copies were made to be interrogated for thousands of years, if nothing else. However, those may have degraded over time, as composed essences are known to do. Another possibility is that some were acquired during the various flood experiments of the humans of Installation 07. There's no reason multiple humans couldn't contain the same imprint, especially after so much time. Remember, these imprints were stored in an individual's DNA and passed down through the generations. But, a third possible source is Mendicant Bias himself. We've seen that the Gravemind is capable of directly interfacing with technology on multiple occasions, be that during its first interaction with Mendicant Bias in the Halo 3 terminals, 
Is this the noble sacrifice my creators spoke of? Where is the nobility in these streets paved with greasy carbon and dun ash? My mouth is speaking at another's behest. That is not my voice. That is the other. Or in human weakness, when it's able to directly interact with Cortana. And it was more than realizing that the Gravemind had breached the mainframe, not just the metal and boards and compositors, but the software processes themselves. Though more than one answer is possible, some we might not have even imagined, there would be a narrative satisfaction in Mendicant being the source for the imprints of Fortensho that the Gravemind reanimates to taunt the Librarian. The Forerunner saga is practically built on this idea. The saga begins when a young Forerunner, born Stellar, goes searching for a precursor artifact known as the Organon, and in the closing moments of the Forerunner Flood War, the Organon is revealed to be the Domain, the information repository that Forerunners had been accessing for millions of years. Mendicant being composed of ancient human essences would fit that same framework. Ultimately though, it remains a bit of fun theory crafting for now, but with Infinite setting the Chief's armored boots on the infamous Installation of Seven, it would be interesting if we might get another look at Mendicant Bias and the remaining secrets his character holds. Audio logs have already confirmed to be returning for Infinite, so perhaps we might find some old logs of Mendy B's creation or his conversations with the Primordial. And perhaps among those, we might learn of his true origins, or at least some new hints towards that end. Anyway though, that's it for this video. Again, please go give Horaspis' original article a read, as he goes into some different details and ideas than I covered here. As I noted at the start, I wanted this video to be my own personal take on the theory, not simply rehashing Horaspis' ideas. The man also has a YouTube channel, and he recently uploaded a narration of Soma the Painter, a short story released with Halo Evolutions Volume 1, and damn does it do the story justice. Thanks for watching, stick around for the Patreon shoutout, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. First, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horaspis patrons. Hope, the very first, and now Freight, the second. Thank you both for your amazing support of the channel. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halo cannon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits, such as behind the scenes materials, including the raw audio for videos and peeks at upcoming videos, or even shout outs like this. All patrons now get early access to certain videos as well, and more benefits are to come. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you aren't already. If you really enjoy my content, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.